You can create your own oasis on your patio, balcony, or even your rooftop. Urban gardener Joanne Daou shows you how to use simple materials to make fantastic growing systems that look great and produce herbs and veggies for your family. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. Well, my name is Joanne Dow, and I'd like to introduce you to my rooftop vegetable garden in downtown Toronto and show you the gardening practices that I use to grow food in a very small space. And so the first five slides that I'll show you um, are my garden from 2004 to 2013. And then I'll go into details about those six uh, techniques that I use to grow food. So I uh, rely on my slideshow, so I'll, I'll uh, direct you to my slideshow uh, now. So... I'm not sure if you can see, I started in 2004. We had renovated our house, and, and at that time, I could get access to the roof. I sat on my bed one day, looking out on the window, and thought, I could grow a tomato out there. And that's how I started. I bummed some uh, um, uh, buckets from my sister, who worked at Campbell's, and then just started on the roof. I'd been gardening in my backyard for a number of years, and, and I figured a vegetable was just a plant, so what was, the, uh, um, what was the big deal? So I went out, and I started with heirloom tomatoes, and that's all I grew for the first year. I bought them at Vicky's Veggies in, uh, in uh, Prince Edward County, and I started. And so this is 2004. Uh, 2006, in the interim, I figured, well, if I could grow a tomato, then I could grow other vegetables as well. So I started with um, uh, uh, peppers and lettuce, etc., all in these, um, all in these buckets. And when I got up there, when we renovated the house, my partner had run water and electricity out onto that area. So I have a tap that runs out there, etc. And when I got onto the roof, the roof uh, seemed very steady. Our house is 100 years old, close to 100 years old, and it's very well built. And that. So I had, I had no idea to bring a structural engineer up there at, uh, at all. I eventually got a structural engineer up there as things went on. So this is 2006. In the interim, I had read about square foot gardening and, and uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to travel to Southeast Asia and India and I came back because in Southeast Asia I came uh, across a product called uh, shade, uh, shade Cloth and also and when you're traveling in that country a lot of people use their roofs and they grow their food and plants on their roofs. Their, their houses are cement in that and those are very uh, solid in that. And in the interim, I'd read about square foot gardening, so I wanted, to, I wanted to try it. And so I had my partner build raised beds. Those raised beds are only 10 inches deep. And I squared them off, etc. And I started um, with square foot gardening. And I'll come back to that. This is what it looked like in July of that year, in 2009, and I was very proud of myself. It was just so wonderful to see all of, that, all of those vegetables up there until the fall. I'll come back to that. And this is what it looks like now. There's a framing system around each of those raised beds. The raised beds have not changed position at all, but a frame has been added to them, trellises have been added to them, and a sub-irrigation system in the bottom of the uh, planters have been added to them. In the, uh, and that was just like organic growth. I didn't plan any of this. It just happened. And so, um, uh, and so that's what it looked like in July um, of last year. So... 
So now I'm going to talk about um, about square foot gardening and why it's a why if you're using a, a raised bed, it's a great method to grow a lot of food in a very small space. When you grid it off, you um, you um, can grow a large vegetable in one square, and then it's the planting guide. So you can grow a lot of onions in one in one square foot. You can grow four lettuces in a square foot. So it gives you that planting guide and that grid, and able to grow a lot of food in a very very small area, and then um, going back to the uh, the uh, uh, f um, and I'm going to I'll stick with that for a minute. And not only that, it allows you to uh, uh, it's a special kind of soil that you use, and I'll go into detail on that in a minute. And it um, it's the uh, it's the soil and the grid and the planting system that really makes square foot gardening uh, interesting to use. And then the framing system. The, the year that um, the beds were up there, on about uh, September, I had been nursing my, uh, my uh, sweet peppers, and they were growing wonderfully, and et cetera. There's a lot of them in, the, in that bed. And then I came up to the roof one day, and they had been cleaned out and attacked by a raccoon. They were just gone, and I was devastated. I have a tree that's uh, right here that's a highway for raccoons and squirrels and they can just get on the roof no, no problem at all and I was just like I thought oh my god so instead of um, thinking of uh, uh, being frustrated by that some of the best teachers on that roof have been the west wind the birds the squirrels and the raccoons because instead of uh, and they've just been able uh, they've enabled me to innovate and to sort of push me into directions that I never thought that I would go in in the in the first place in that so and so that winter I researched frames and that's where this this system came from it's called build a ball framing system they look like this and I'll pass them around they come from England and there's five small holes and two very large holes so you can you can uh, um, I use aluminum uh, uh, aluminum uh, um, tubing and a conduit to uh, build those particular frames so I'll just pass these around you can take a look at them and they come apart um, and they, they uh, slot up fairly fast and they come apart fairly fast so that system I then asked my partner to to um, um, make adaptions to the bed and he enabled me to put that framing system around it okay and with that framing system came the ability for different kinds of plant uh, uh, structures or plant cover protection so in the spring I started my peas very early one year and I used these water wells these are you can put water in these um, in these so you put water in there the sun beats down heats up the uh, plant inside and it's like a little greenhouse except what I did with these is I cut them apart taped them back together again and and span the whole bed so I figuring the sun would do exactly the same thing and it did I was able to have peas early in the year but it allowed me to to uh, extend my season so they're like those beds are like are now like mini greenhouses on that roof and then after that, I, um, I'll go back to this. In, this, in the uh, summertime, when I first started up on that roof, my lettuce bolted. And because I was a beginner gardener, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know that you couldn't grow lettuce in the heat of the summer, etc. So now, with shade cloth, it, um, um, the beds, the uh, frames are covered in shade cloth in the summertime. So that knocks the temperature down in those beds by 50%. And so you can grow lettuce and greens all summer long using, those, uh, using that shade cloth and then in the fall 
you can you can put wire mesh around the uh, the beds as well and that prevents those raccoons from coming in and munching on your sweet peppers etc so and it keeps the squirrels out as well and it keeps the the it keeps the birds out in the spring from going after your seedlings etc so the framing system and I in this again was organic growth it just to me it came um, as I I kind of invented it as I went along I figured well if I could put the frame up then let's see what uh, what I can cover it with etc so that's what that enabled me to do and then the other one is if you want to plant early in the spring you can use these in individual pots and again they become uh, when you fill them up with water they sort of make a uh, sort of make a teepee and again it creates a mini greenhouse in each of your buckets the same with kaloshes you can find people pitch out their water bottles so I pick them up um, slice them off at the bottom put a hole in the top and put them on a bucket as well and that becomes a mini greenhouse as well so now I'm going to talk about soil when you're using when you're um, uh, growing in a raised bed you're using a special type of soil because uh, and you're not using it straight out of your garden the soil has to be light because the plants don't have the opportunity to go deep they have the opportunity to go sideways and so you need to be able to provide a lightweight soil that enables the plant to move uh, through the soil particles and so I started off with Mel's mix and this is Mel Bartholomew who invented square foot gardening and this is what he this is his mix so a third peat moss a third vermiculite and a third blended compost and the blended compost comes from five different sources of compost and that so that's a big trick about trying to find the uh, those five sources of compost and it goes by uh, it goes by volume it doesn't go by weight and the way he gets you to mix the soil is you put it on a big tarp throw all the ingredients in it and move that tarp around well that's that's a lot of work when you're trying to fill up six raised beds and 61 buckets that I have on that roof so that's a lot of soil so I use things like sheep manure I use things like duck manure and worm castings I now have my own worm bins in the basement so I'm producing my own compost and that's uh, um, so that's what I started out with and that is also on your handout I prepared a handout for you and that soil mixture is right here on this second page but the soil mixture I'm using right now is on this page and I want to talk a little bit about that so this soil formula um, I have a hydroponic shop not very far from where I live and I wandered in there one day I used to bomb by this place and it was always really bright lights and that and they had the word grow on top and I thought oh I stopped the car one Sunday afternoon and walked and peeked in the window and at that time I was looking for black pots because I'm a designer I like everything sort of neat and tidy and that and I looked in the window and they had black buckets I thought I died and gone to heaven and so the next day I walked into this place and I really didn't know much about hydroponics etc and I was and the staff in there are very good and they will take beginner questions and that so I was walking around looking at all of the products in that and they had a very very expensive bale of peat moss and I looked at it and he said well that's forty two dollars and I thought geez what's in that peat moss and so uh, so, and, and just after that a young man came in and he was dressed in black had tattoos and and body armament and said to the uh, to the clerk I'll take 15 of those bales of hay or uh, bales of peat moss and I went and I kind of looked up and said you're not growing tomatoes and that but it was it was a great place to be and I went back all the time because those guys they know about soil and they know about what a plant needs and their plants have to grow six feet tall so they really know and so they gave me Paul Norton 
he's moved on from uh, uh, Grow It All, gave me this soil formula. And so you start off with, um, he uses, they use ProMix, etc. So you start off with 80 liters of uh, soilless mix. You add 20 liters of worm casting or a blended compost. And I usually use sea or forest um, uh, compost. And now I'm using my own worm castings. And then um, rock phosphate, which adds your phosphorus, and glacier rock dust, and green sand, which adds your potassium. And then 20, uh, 21 tablespoons of a, of a long-term uh, or slow-release fertilizer. And when I started to use that formula and, and um, the SIP systems in the bottom of my planters, my partner came on the roof one day and looked at the growth on that roof and said, what did you do? Because it was a jungle, I'm telling you. And that's when, I, that's when I called the structural engineer. Seven years after I'd started on the roof, I called the structural engineer because I knew visually I had reached my, the limit of what I could grow on that roof. So now instead of adding more, I take a few things off every year and I'm, I sort of, um, I'm a little bit more conservative etc. But that is a wonderful uh, soil mix uh, for, um, for you to uh, use. And I know it comes with problems because of the peat moss industry, etc., et, etc., et and the non-sustainability. And the list that I've given you there comes from, it gives you um, a green... Um, it gives you a green grade of all of the ingredients that are in that particular formula. And you can see the first one says grade D beca uh, for peat moss because of habit uh, 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 disruption, etc. And the, and the non-renewability of uh, uh, peat bogs and stuff. So now I've started to switch to uh, koi. And uh, my worm bins are, are, my bedding is that. And I'm trying to eventually switch to a coconut-based uh, for my for my soilless mix, but it's going to take me a while, and that because I've had problems trying to start seeds in in that base, etc. So it, I'm trying to figure that out right now. But that is an excellent soilless mix for a raised bed. Now I'm going to get into sub irrigation. Sub irrigation, I introduced that to my beds because after a number of years, I had such a water runoff on that roof that I would water my plants and then it would just, it would, and it runs off into my front garden. And I thought, well, that's fine. My front garden is getting uh, watered, but I wanted to be able to control that. I knew nothing about sub irrigation. I didn't even know the term, but I went on the internet and I did research. I re usually research in the winter time and I, and like I tell people, I met a man on the internet. And this man's name was Bob Highland. And Bob is 78 years old. I think he might be 80 by now. And, um, but he's an expert in sub-irrigation systems. And he really promotes it. He lives in Brooklyn, etc. And he really promotes uh, growing in raised beds. So I read through his complete archive. And by the time I was finished, I was ready to go into, into sub-irrigation. So I tracked him down. I got his email. And I had a few questions, so I went after him and, and, um, and talked to him about the structure of what I wanted to do. And he was very kind. He wrote back, and we developed a, a good internet relationship, etc. So sub-irrigation basically refers to any method of watering plants by allowing the water to soak up into the plant by introducing it from the, uh, from the uh, top, or introducing it from the top, but it goes directly to the root ball. And sub-irrigation is healthier because the soil is watered from below wa and, the, and it disper disperses through the soil more evenly and it creates a, a more even watering cycle and a better root ball. And so um, if you take a look at the, at the um, first page of your handout, you will see the, uh, the anatomy of what a sip looks like. So basically you have your soilless mixture, you have your oxygen, your water oxygen reservoir, which looks like this. And this is the system that I use, although you can uh, use many different ones. And um, then you have, in a pot, you have, I'll take this one here. 
this is an, another system that I in, uh, invented. So the water, this, this uh, reservoir sits in the bottom of the pot. It has a, a fill tube, which is a water bottle. And out of the side comes your overflow tube. So, and that's basically it. That, that's it. You have to have a pot with no holes in it. But the only problem was I had 61 pots with holes in it. And so I had to uh, um, figure out how I could, pr how I could um, work this system. So I, I went after putting a plastic liner, cutting a circle out of this uh, um, vapor barrier because I had it and at the home. And I, I cut a circle. And then I put my chamber or my reservoir like this and sunk it into my pot and through this I then had I ran my overflow hole through the plastic to the outside of the pot except that most of my pots because when you design this system your overflow hole is, is determined by the uh, depth of your water oxygen reservoir. So for this, the overflow hole goes at the top of this reservoir, and so four inches of water can sit in the bottom of this particular pot. There is a formula that you can, uh, that you can uh, use to determine how much water can fit in the bottom of each of your pots, and that is based on the earth, uh, the earth box formula. The earth box uses 16% of the volume of its pot for water in the base, for, the, for its oxygen reservoir its oxygen water reservoir and so you can you can actually figure out every pot that you that you own you could figure out how much water will go into that pot but these days I just uh, use this uh, this uh, reservoir device and I put my oxy I put my overflow tube at the top and that is perfectly fine but the problem with with um, like I, I'll go back to the problem of, of, of trying to use this system with pots that already have holes in them because most of the pots that you, that we have will have holes in the bottom so you and you don't want to drill into some fancy pot so how do you design the 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 uh, reservoir so that as the water fills up in the base it will be able to drain out at a certain point so what you do with this is as this plastic You'll put this piece of plastic in around this reservoir and what you will do with this plastic is you will punch a number of holes at the top of the plastic and that will, as the water uh, comes up to those particular holes, the water will drain out of those holes and go down the side and out the bottom of your pot. The only problem with that is that once you get this inside your pot and the soil inside this it will smash up to, uh, against the edge of your pot and it won't create that that space that you need for the water to drain out so you can use and I have it here somewhere you can use these this that's weeping. It goes on the side of your house. It's used for weeping tile. My, um, my neighbor was renovating his house and he pitched out a lot of this and I was walking by one day and I thought, geez, I could use that. So that's what, um, so that's what goes on the side of the pot. So your reservoir, your plastic goes in, this goes on the outside of your plastic and, your, um, and the holes go at the top of your plastic and you can convert any pot with holes in it into a SIP system. And that sub-irrigation systems, we call them SIPs for short, etc. So if you take a look, you've got your soilless mixture, your overflow hole, your landscape cloth, that's the other thing, landscape cloth. 
landscape cloth goes on top of this because the roots, as they come down, will find their way into the perforations that are in this, uh, in this tube. And if to, to save yourself from picking them all out in the fall, and that you use landscape cloth. But I discovered recently that black nylon stockings work just as well. So, <laughs> so off I went to buy 75 packages of black nylon stockings from, from uh, the dollar store. And the clerk, young clerk looks at me and he says, what are you doing with all those stockings? And I said, you won't believe me. <laughs> so just never mind. So here it is. So, you, so you're, um, you put your landscape cloth, and I will show you a slide in a minute where um, you can see the roots of a tomato plant and how they get around, it, uh, how they get around or grow down into this. So again, landscape cloth, planter with no holes, etc. Now, you can find black pots with no holes in it. And, you, and it's the floral industry that produces them because those pots have all of their cut flowers in them. And I stumbled upon this one day when I was buying vegetables from my local grocer. And out the back where they store all of their, their boxes, etc., were these pots. And anything black and it's a pot, I'll take a look at it. I just sort of zoom into it. And I looked and I went, oh my God, it doesn't have any holes in it. I thought, again, I died and gone to heaven. So I walked back in the store and said, can I have those? They gave me tons and that, and for nothing. So I then now use this system. This is another system. I'll show you a bunch in a minute. This system that fits in the bottom of all of these planters. And this, again, is a water oxygen reservoir. This product Lee Valley used to sell. They don't sell them anymore. And I had changed all of my, I'd taken all of the stones out of the bottom of my pots because I wanted to cut the weight down on my roof. And I began to use these. And I had a bunch. So I figured, well, you know what? That is already an oxygen water reservoir, except it doesn't have a place for your, for your overflow tube and, and your fill tube. So I just, just drilled into it. And that's with this pot. This is, my, this is one of my favorite herbs from, um, from uh, Richter's. I grow this one every year. And this is what's in the bottom of this pot. This is compact thyme. And it's a wonderful time because it grows into a beautiful bush. And my partner is a former chef, so he loves this time, and we cook with it uh, quite a lot. And this plant I bought small, just a small plant last year, and this is one year's growth in this particular pot. And, that. So, and again, it has a water oxygen reservoir in the bottom of it that I brought it in to show you. Now, once you understand that... You can do things like, I've just explained this um, to you. You can do things like this. Those are flexi, uh, flexi tubes. And, and you can buy them at Home Depot. They, uh, um, and so that's what I use for my, uh, for my reservoirs and that. And you need about 31 inches and it becomes, and you can just flip it into a donut etc. They come with a coupling system that you can buy, but you can, you can avoid that cost by just simply using those, uh, um, uh, these, because this is four inches apparently, and that's four inches, but this one fits into this, so I don't know whose four inches we're, we're talking about here, but this acts as a coupling system as well. So just 31 inches will change this into a sub-irrigation system. I'm losing my head here. Okay, so if you can see that, that is one year's growth of a tomato plant. So this is, the, this is your fill tube here, and these are all the roots. That's your um, landscape cloth, and this is what the, uh, the root system looks like in the bottom of that tomato plant. Those tomatoes grow fairly tall because you've got constant uh, access to water. The, uh, the, the soil is constantly moist, etc. So it's a, it's a wonderful system. It's a wonderful system for balconies as well because you get a, a range of temperature on that balcony and the pot 
is always the root ball is moist and it's aerated as well. So and again, it works for for good community uh, uh, practices because your water's not dripping onto your uh, onto your neighbor's balcony because no water will run out of these systems except when it rains and the water um, uh, comes up to the top of the overflow hole. That's the only time the water will flow out um, of this system. So that's your tomato. And then you can, once you understand that, you can make them simply like this as well, out of buckets, out of old juice bottles. So you can bore holes in, in here, put a, uh, put a slot in the bottom. Um, and link them together and they don't have to be linked together they just have to sit the water just sits in the bottom and as it as it moves through the bottom the, wa the water will come up into each of these uh, juice buckets through this hole right here and you cover it again with landscape cloth and as soon as the um, soil meets the uh, the water the water will immediately start to come up into into the uh, to meet the root of the plant and and what happens is it creates as the water dissipates into the soil by capillary action it will create an oxygen chamber in the top here and that's why they're called Oxi uh, water oxygen uh, reservoirs and you want that oxygen chamber there because you need oxygen to the uh, to the roots of your plant it works perfectly and so this is another and so when I'm doing community workshops we work with a lot of recycled plastic and uh, recycled plastic uh, uh, totes etc so and I've tested out all of these whatever I whatever I show you I've, I've grown in it for a season to see how it works And to make holes in there, I use a heat, uh, a heat tool. And again, stand downwind of those heat tools because you're heating plastic and you just don't want to smell that, get that into your lungs, etc. And then again, I think I have some. You can do the same thing with these, with your, uh, with your um, um, this is yogurt, um, etc. So they again act the same way. And if you're looking for something smaller, as long as it's durable plastic, and because remember, the weight of the soil is going to bear down on, on this, and so your water bottle has to be durable plastic as well. Because what you end up doing with the water bottles in the, uh, when your plant is growing is you sleeve them together. Because you can see from this plant, you can put that, uh, that um, fill tube fairly uh, uh, um, down, but when you have a tall tomato plant and you're trying to water it, you're you're kind of bending down and trying to find the hole, the, uh, this hole. And so what you do is you just sleeve them together, so it so that you don't end up having to bend and that. So so it and it uh, works especially for tall uh, plants like tomatoes, etc., or your beans. Uh, yeah. And so here's again, this is another uh, system I have on the roof. And what I do now with these three, those are, um, um, with these three pipes, is I make sure that the, the uh, tube is screwed to the top of the pipe because then that means the tube won't move around and it will uh, stay in the same place, etc. So that's uh, one of the buckets I have on the roof. And then you can do balcony planters as well. Balcony planters look like this, nylon stocking, <laughs> and, and this is cut in half. So I took that tube and it has a nice seam straight down on either side so you can cut straight. And you use a good pair of scissors like this and you can cut any of those uh, any of these tubes and so you just then insert your water or your uh, fill tube like that and you can put this in a balcony planter and it becomes a sub irrigation system as well and so I have and balcony planters the depth of a balcony planter is great depth for growing radishes and lettuce and uh, and onions in them and that so that's what you can um, Okay, this is a system 
This is Jim Lister's system, and he, he lives in Alaska. Um, and he has, and, and this is his sub irrigation system. What he does is he cuts holes in, in a, uh, a five gallon bucket. And what that, what that mimics is this system right here. This is a planter. And it's, and, uh, it's a small one. You, they, uh, they come very large and they sort of uh, move together like this. And they're called air pruning uh, uh, planters. What happens with air pruning is that the roots, most roots when you, will become root bound in, in, uh, in pots and their roots will circle the inside of the pot. With air pruning, as soon as the root reaches, the, uh, reaches this little area here, it will prune itself off. And what, and, um, and what happens is that then you get a lot of fibrous little roots along that, or along that main root and, that, and those little fibrous roots are really good, for the, uh, really good for the plant because they take in more water and they take in more nutrient and, uh, and that. So they use these to grow trees in and uh, they come very large and I, grow, I grew a tomato in them last year on my roof. They've changed the design since I bought this one by, uh, and what they've done is they filled the top holes because as you're watering through it, water will sort of spill out the top before it actually gets to the bottom. So the idea of air pruning works here. And it's the same thing. So Jim inserts a, a, a bag inside this bucket. And when the roots hit the outside of that, they air prune themselves. And the same with when you're growing in fabric grow bags. And I brought one. So fabric grow bags are very popular to grow in now. There's a, um, again, Montreal kind of leads the way. There's a, a tremendous rooftop garden in Montreal that uses fabric grow bags. And fabric grow bags do the same thing. As soon as the root hits the edge, it prunes itself off, and so you get a, a fibrous uh, root system in the bottom. And it's, a, it's a, great way, a great way to grow, especially if you're trying to mitigate the weight on, on a roof, fabric grow bags are a good way to go but of course I want a sip system in the bottom of that fabric grow bag as well so here's um, I don't recommend they they're not selling these anymore and I uh, contact the company in the States and they're not selling them so and I don't re I don't really recommend this system because it's actually it's made with a sump pump um, um, a drainage kit and I like the fact that the pipe becomes the fill tube I like that part of the design but it's very hard to snake that thing into a spiral and that so I like designs that that are uh, that are easy to do because when you're doing 61 things all uh, together you want something that you can repeat and repeat Okay, and this is the one that started it all. This comes from Montreal, and this is corrugated plast. And again, it's just folded like this. The soil um, meets the water right here. That's your fill tube. And they've grown wonderful things in this, uh, in this system. They were, giving, they were teaching people how to do this on their balconies in Montreal, and that's where this came into, or sort of moved its way across Canada. And then, of course, once you understand that, this is my backyard when I, took, when I converted all of my, um, all of my annual pots because I had a big container gardening garden out at the back. So this is clay, um, uh, plastic, rubber, uh, wood, um, styrofoam, etc. And so you can see that it doesn't matter. And most of these things, most of them, because they already had holes in them, if I didn't silicone the holes shut, I put in a plastic uh, uh, a liner to create. So all of my annuals in my backyard now have SIP systems in the bottom of them as well. Okay. Now, fabric grow bags. This is a, um, an advertisement from Lee Valley. That's the bag that they're, um, um, they use. And this is my SIP system in the bottom of that bag. So 
if you want um, air, um, air pruning, root pruning, etc., I want the best of both. I want a system in the bottom, and, uh, and I want this. So I cut down an old um, uh, tub. I put in two uh, juice bottles, put in my fill tube, covered it with landscape cloth, and the first year, I, um, this was 2012, I grew this tomato, etc. So it, it works. It was, it's a good system. But of course, it's not, uh, uh, of course I want to perfect it a little bit. And so I went on to this. I don't recommend this system. I've got 12 grow bags on my roof right now. And this is pond liner. Eventually, pond liner looks like this. Pond liner is fish and plant safe liner. And this is what I use now to line my raised beds. And that I used to use uh, a plastic for many years until I did a, a workshop, a community workshop, and they wanted me to use this to do their, uh, to do their raised beds. And, that, and that's where I discovered that. And this is great. It lasts for many, uh, uh, many years. And so I created this um, this uh, system where I put, th um, put it so, or, or sort of attached it to the bottom of the bag and I again used that donut um, 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 reservoir and then I put them on the roof. I grew my eggplants in them last year, I grew cucumbers, I grew tomatoes, etc. But I'm still not convinced that that is the best design <laughs> for this because uh, some of them leaked and if you have leaking water on, on a roof and that you get algae and the last thing you want is algae because it goes after the oxygen uh, um, uh, for the roots of the plant and uh, so it's I don't recommend this method just yet I still have a few years to perfect this but I'm looking for to uh, to do both with this particular bag system and so this is my this is a, a shot of the roof last uh, last summer when I was growing beets etc. Et and these bags didn't have a sip system in there, and I sunk them into a um, a small container to to uh, to so I watered down through here down in here and they went up through the uh, the bag. So I, it was kind of a a kind of a sip system etc. But again. Uh, when the sun beats, you will get an algae buildup, and you'll get an algae buildup on the side of the uh, on the side of the bag and in the uh, and in the tray itself, and that. So, I'm not uh, I'm not keen about this method just yet. So here's um, um, so I'm going to move now on to the raised beds and putting a sub irrigation uh, system into a raised bed. So my raised beds were never designed for frames and they weren't designed for sub, uh, sub irrigation systems. They're 10 inches deep and that's it. And I grow uh, cucumbers and beans and, and peppers in 10, inches of, in 10 inches of soil. So now I wanted to add a SIP system to that. So what I ended up doing was I ended up cutting the pipes in half. And so instead of uh, using the whole four inches, I now have a depth of, of uh, two inches. And that works fine. And so it's exactly the same thing. You, um, this is your, your uh, pond liner uh, right here. And then your, your um, uh, landscape cloth. These are your pipes. So that's your, your water oxygen reservoir and your overflow hole. The most important thing about the overflow hole is it has to pierce into one of the pipes. And in the raised bed, it's not going to pierce into the pipe because this is only half it's only half a pipe. So what it does is it sits right at oops. It sits right at the very top of the pipe here. And so I'm going to show you. One of my students did these illustrations uh, for me. I commissioned her to do them. And so this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a shot uh, down. So you put, the, uh, you put the pond liner into the whole bed and up to the sides. You fold it down along the top and you staple the whole way around. Staple it at the top. Then you have to figure out where you want the overflow hole for that particular, um, um, uh, for that particular bed. And, and I know that... Um, 
I can ha these beds can hold six gallons of water. So what I did was after I put this uh, um, system, uh, after I put the uh, bed in there, I filled it up with six gallons of water to see where the top of the, uh, where it would uh, uh, even out. And when you're working with SIPs, they have to be level. So you have to level them out or you'll get water pooling in one area. So when you're on a slanted roof like I am and that you, leveling is something I do every spring. I make sure I try and level and my beds and all my pots sit on two inches of styrofoam because I'm right on the, the original surface of the, uh, of the uh, roof. And, it, uh, and I wanted to keep it that way because I want the heat my, and that's why I changed to black pots. I don't want white pots. I want to, uh, the heat for my tomatoes and my and my peppers, etc. Et so I'm walking on, I'm, and there's very little space to walk on in that roof now, and uh, so I'm walking on the original um, uh, surface. So your overflow hole comes in there, and then um, here here I am stapling it uh, together. And then you lay your pipes in like this they go straight they go straight across so again they're cut and again um, they they have a beautiful seam so you can cut those pipes uh, uh, fairly straight and you just lay them in right beside one another leave a little bit of space between them because it that it's that space where the water will meet the soil and the uh, wicking action will will happen and you can see over here you usually put the overflow hole on the opposite side of where you put the the fill tube etc so my overflow hole my fill tube is going here and um, I have a feeling my overflow hole is is uh, is on that same uh, spot and then you lay in your your um, your landscape cloth and you make sure you t you uh, tap it in in between here because like I said this is where the water and uh, will meet the soil and capillary action will start and um, and then after that you just fill your bed right up to the top and you're ready to go I use a um, Oh, and this is my, uh, and, and that's Swiss char in one of those beds. So Swiss char, there's, there, um, it's a two by four foot bed, so there's two, four, six, eight, uh, eight squares in there, and I can grow four Swiss char in each, of those, uh, in each of those squares. So you can, like I said before, grow a lot of food in a very small area. And that's, so we, we eat Swiss char a lot all summer. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm going to move on to trellises. You, we, um, when you have a garden, you have six cubic feet of vertical acreage above your head that you can, that you can farm as well. It, and especially if you're working in small spaces, trellises are, are as a way to move those vegetables up and, to cl and actually to claim that space. So this is the first trellis I ever made on my roof. It's still standing. I'm going to be actually taking it down this summer. And, that, and, um, and I'm a little bit of a maniac because when I, it took me eight hours to figure this thing out because I was using these, these uh, Figo uh, connectors from England. And, um, and so I got it up there and it wasn't symmetrical. So I took it apart and did it again. And I, I, I sometimes drive myself nuts. And, um, and those buckets, so this thing is on the roof and there is a uh, conduit uh, that runs right through all of these buckets. So it, it creates an area where when I string, uh, when I strung the jute here, it, um, I could attach it to something and that, and they won't... Um, so that's what it looks like when it was full. And when, um, and I was growing um, uh, yellow uh, snap peas from India, and they're beautiful. It's a, it's a product uh, that Urban Harvest sells. They're wonderful snap peas, um, et cetera. So, and when you grow them with blue, uh, 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 blue potted peas, they look great as well. You know, you want form and function on that roof. You know, you want your vegetables to look good as well as to, uh, as to be tasty.
And this is last year, and that's zucchini growing in those same bins, etc. And then when I grew those zucchini, I thought, note to self, don't put a zucchini beside the entrance of your garden, right? Because they're like dinosaur leaves, you know? It's like, holy crap! And, uh, and that, so that's my zucchini, and we produced, I, I, we produced how many zucchini I have it here. I noted how many things I grew last year. 30 zucchini last year that we harvested. No, there's four, there's one, two, three plants there, four, five plants on the other, on the other side as well. Oh yeah, and you know, that's the other thing. The first year I grew a broccoli was the last year I grew a broccoli on the roof because they take up too much room. You know, when you're working in small space, you have to really be conscious of what you're going to grow and that. And then I like to grow plants because I like to look at them and that my partner likes to use them to cook and that. And so we kind of have a battle uh, sometimes because I will give him the um, uh, rosemary that he can use for his cooking while I can keep the rosemary here that I can gaze upon all summer and that so but um, but it is it's you know and now I only grow food that we actually eat and uh, and herbs that we actually use etc so I've come to I've come to my senses and so once you get a framing system up there again plant covers is one and then you can go well if I can do a um, if I can go four feet well why can't I go six feet with that trellis and that and so that's what I did I started to go up and again this is where I grow my cucumbers and once you start to go up, you then have problems with the wind because the wind will hit that roof and then will move around. But you can also um, um, position those uh, trellises so they act as guards against, to, uh, against your poor little tomato seedlings in the spring when that wind has no mercy and it will just take that seedling and just whack it to death. Um, um, and so... What I did, what I started to do with my tomato plants was to grow them longer. So I trench plant them now. In, um, so they're very long when I plant them because they have, an, uh, they have a small area that's sticking out at the top, but they've got a strong stem that holds them together on a, a very windy roof, etc. So, so again, thank you to the wind for pushing me to innovate. Um, um, and so this is, what the, uh, this is the trellis that I started with on this section of the roof and that's last year on the roof so here are these are beans beans and cucumbers here beans and, zuc and zucchini at the back etc and my tomato plants are in the back of this particular trellis and that so by positioning your trellises you can mitigate the damage the wind does um, to your other vegetables etc and so now I go up so uh, so again I'm looking at going six feet up so I can grow my beans and my peas and this is the this is my uh, uh, bean trellis from the other side, and that's my cucumber my, my the uh, very uh, uh, small little cucumbers. They look like uh, baby watermelons, and that mush uh, mushmelons I think they're called. So that's that vine. It, what, what? Oh yes, that's right. And and on the other side. I just stuck in a couple cantaloupe and a watermelon last year to just test it out and I ignored those two plants all, all uh, um, summer until they started to produce and then um, so I was able to grow cantaloupe so now I'm actually going to seriously grow cantaloupe this year. I just wanted to test to see if it worked and it does. So there, that's my watermelon and my cantaloupe. And you make them, and you can grow them vertically, and you can, again, use nylon stockings, right? I was, I was asking my uncle about structures and that, and he would always tell me, well, what would Grandma do? And the first thing I thought of was nylon stockings because my grandmother would weave the, chair, the, the seats of her chairs out of nylon stockings and, and rugs and all of that, and that woman was a nylon stocking expert in that. And so when... I go to uh, uh, pull my, put my trellises together now. I use nylon stockings, and that way those trellises will never come apart. And I can actually lift them up all together and move them. And that. So those are my uh, the cantaloupe and watermelon I grew last year. 
And this is, and, and I have a battle with those, uh, those uh, uh, cone, um, those tomato cages and that, I just don't like them. I've used them for many years, and every year I sort of pitch them off the roof going, oh, I hate these things. So I found a, a square trellis that I actually like to use. It's very, it's, uh, very sturdy. And so I, this, is, this was the setup last year for my eggplants, and I positioned three trellises because I don't want to trellis everything because I'm still worried about the weight. So I, I, I put three of them up there, and then I put garden stakes horizontally to connect the trellises together and attach them with nylon stockings. And in between, so the, so the, uh, um, the grow bag that didn't have a trellis I made sidebars out of nylon stockings, so as the plant grew, it had something to uh, to grow up on, and that. So this is my structure on this is my structure now on that roof, and uh, and it worked uh, it worked out well. And this is it from the other side, and when I started to uh, to grow, I don't know what it is about raccoons, but they like unripe eggplants. I don't get it. Wait until it's ripe at least, you know, but they will attack those eggplants all the time. And uh, um, so I now, when, once I get that structure up, it becomes Fort Knox. And so I get um, um, bird netting and rabbit, uh, rabbit fencing. And then read the comments on the, uh, on the line when people are selling rabbit fencing and that. And, they, and the people are just like, what is this? That rabbit can jump into the, you know, because the, the fencing is very small at the bottom and then it gets, the, the, uh, the spaces get uh, um, more space in between, about 12 inches up, but you know, a rabbit can jump 12 inches, so it's like that, it's useless, but I use it on my roof because it's two feet, um, uh, two feet long, and it fits perfectly around those beds, and then I just put uh, bird netting around it so that it will discourage the, uh, the animals. And the other thing I do with bird netting is I pull it out of the package, and every so many feet I uh, put a little Velcro around it, so it becomes like a snake and then I weave that in and around my tomato uh, pots and the squirrels won't go after those tomatoes because they can't stand getting their claws stuck in that, uh, in that bird netting. So I've been able to keep the squirrels away from my, uh, uh, my tomatoes. So this is what the eggplants looked like uh, last year and I grew a Turkish eggplant last year as well and they were a particular favorite of the, of the uh, raccoons and that so... And this is my harvest. That was um, uh, August last year. I produced um, 115 pounds of tomatoes, 17 pounds less than I produced the year before, 30 zucchini, 53 uh, uh, cucumbers, and then I didn't count the beans. I figured, what the hell? And, uh, so, and lots of lettuce, beets, uh, um, sweet peppers, and uh, watermelon, a cantaloupe, and lots of herbs. I, we grow about 24 of those plants, and we dry them in the, uh, in the wintertime in the basement, etc. And, and about seven different kinds of mint on the roof. So there's like six raised beds and 61, uh, and 61 pots. So... I just want to show you, to end this, I, I want to uh, show you some, um, uh, Lacuse, uh, some commercial SIP uh, um, systems that are available uh, to buy. And this is the gold standard of SIP systems. It's a Lacuse, it's a German product, it's beautifully designed. It has a, um, a water gauge here so you can check the, uh, check the level of the water, etc. And it ha it's a, 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 a double bucket. So these uh, little planters will come out and you will um, fill those planters with soil and put them back and that's the surface of it. And, they're, and they are plastic experts because their uh, mother company is um, Playmobil Toys and so those things, those planters can stay outside for a long time. They're ex very expensive. This one's about 60, this is a double planter, it's about 68 bucks and these are $100 each and that. So you can... Um, I encourage you to make your own. But they do last, and they're beautiful to look at, and great design, etc. Et
And then this is the earth box, standard, uh, standard earth box. The, uh, the beauty about the earth box is it comes with a shower cap so the rain will not uh, go on, uh, into, your, uh, into your soil if you, if you live in a very rainy uh, spot. But after the plant grows, the leaves kind of tend to uh, move the water off the, uh, off the area as well. So, but they work and they were, they're sort of the standard that uh, people uh, base their designs on now. And then this is a, a pot insert um, that fits into any standard pot. It's again, it's a sip system. The only problem with this is your, is your, um, is that fill tube. It always seems to be in the middle of where you want to plant that plant, right? It's a German design too, so I'm really surprised that they didn't put that thing in a pot first to figure out where that fill tube should go. But they work. I have them in some of my annual planters as well. And that, so they, um, um, and they're sold. This is a fella down in the States. This man makes coverings for boats. He's a boat upholsterer. But he's also a tomato um, um, fanatic. And so he started to use, he started to make his own grow bags. He also lives in a very windy spot, in hurricanes, I guess, in Florida. So now he has, and I've watched him, I've watched him uh, change his, uh, his design. So now he has hurricane straps that are attached to this, uh, to this grow bag. And they attach to... To the uh, to the frame to your tomato frame and that just in case that hurricane's going to come along it's going to take the whole thing with it but it's brilliant and uh, and it works he grows a lot of tomatoes in there so and it's a very nice design and he sends them out to people along with a along with a package of, t of his toma uh, favorite tomato seeds. Now, I want to introduce you to George Hendren Sr. George Hendren is a friend of mine, again, an internet uh, um, farming friend of mine in that. And this man is brilliant. He made an automatic raised uh, bed uh, an automatic watering raised bed because you um, there's a system out and I think some of you may know it uh, Larry Hall's rain gutter grow system or um, and but this one here and um, is a it f kind of follows the same thing except it's in uh, the, s the uh, uh, tubes are inside and so what George um, uh, did was he added a waste paper basket and a mini float valve and so that controls the water level uh, that is allowed into into his raised beds these are these are the same pipes that I'm using except they have white socks on them and those are spacers in between these pipes so this is his, uh, this is his uh, process. He has a number of raised beds on his property um, and they're designed on an Oregon uh, uh, system and they can become, uh, they're like cloches, they will close themselves in with plastic etc and he's got a sip system in the bottom. And so this is his process. He's lining the beds here. He puts in his pipes and he has one of the pipes that, uh, that fits right into the waste paper basket and inside that waste paper basket is the mini float valve. The mini float valve is the same float valve that they use for the rain gutter grow systems, etc. And so that's it from the top. There's your, there you can, uh, you can barely see it, but here's your, this is your pipe here and that's your mini float valve, etc. There it is from the side, where he connects that to his uh, water hose. Again, the mini float valve, etc. And those spacers are used to keep the pipes straight, um, so, uh, and it aids in planting. There he is filling the uh, soil in the planters. So he's built them on the side of his wall, etc. And he's got a number of planters on this side as well. He lives in, Mini he lives in Minnesota. And um, there they are to the top. There's his overflow uh, valve right here, where the water will drain out. And then he can extend, he can have an extended growing season by, uh, uh, by making them into individual small little greenhouses. This man's pretty amazing. He's, uh, he's 79 years old this year, and that's what they, uh, what they look like. 
And this is the rain gutter grow system. Now this came, became popular a couple, uh, a couple years ago and that's a rain gutter, a mini float valve in between two pieces of, of, uh, of um, uh, two by four and that keeps the rain gutter uh, stable. The only problem with and it, the bucket and inside, at, at the bottom of the bucket is a net basket and this is what a net basket looks like. It has holes in it, so you put the soil in here. This is, uh, and that uh, that sinks into the uh, into the gutter. The gutter is where the water is, and so the capillary action happens right here. The wicking action happens right here, and it takes the uh, it takes the water up into the soil, etc. And you can automatically water a number. You can see that all of those buckets are growing something in there, and it's a it's a very interesting system. The only problem with it when it first came out um, was, and that's one of the beauties of the internet when you're trying, it's like the 18th century coffee houses, right, where people got together and tried to figure out ideas, it said. So, so um, the uncovered gutters, you would have mosquito larvae uh, nesting in there, and you would have an algae buildup. So what happened eventually to this system was this. This is Brad Quavar's take on the rain gutter grow system. So those uh, individual blue things are all pots. And it, those, um, and he just, uh, he used a PVC tube. And he cut holes in the PVC tube big enough for the net baskets to fit in. And so it became an enclosed system. So it cut down on the mosquitoes and it cut down on the algae. He still put those, those systems in between uh, uh, two two by fours to keep it stable. But he has a rain barrel and a float bucket here. And the rain barrel fills with water. The float bucket will control the level of water in each of those gutters. And you can have an automatic watering system for, uh, for your SIP garden. And so that's what, that's what it looks like. Your float valve is right here. And this is, that hole will fit those net baskets. And it can go on for miles. And so this is another, here's another uh, view of it. And this one just came up last year. This one actually has pipes in the bottom of this bed. Those uh, buckets will fit into the, into the pipes. And this system, you can move it around. And you can also shelter it as well. It would be beautiful for a senior's home or a community uh, uh, garden, etc. And then you're, all you're doing is you're taking those out at the end of the summer, dumping it, and, and uh, refilling it with soil. So that, uh, that is an automatic um, uh, watering system for, uh, for SIPs. And you can, you can Google it by um, Googling Larry Hall. And he's got lots of, uh, lots of fans, etc. And a lot of people who are using that particular system now. And um, mine, is, uh, mine would be called a standalone system because I water each of my pots individually. And that's it. And there you go. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a, um, I don't replace it every year. I replace it every three years. But I do, um, I take a third of it out and I add compost to it. And that because what happens in a, a closed system like that is there's a salt buildup in that soil. And so every three years, I, I will then take that, uh, take the soil that's in those buckets and um, uh, dump all the buckets and begin to move it around my, um, my roof or move it off my roof roof into my uh, container uh, garden in the backyard and that so but it's about every three years but every year I add new compost to it and I've been testing out this that that second uh, soil formula um, and so I know that uh, potassium and rock phosphate takes a, it takes a couple years to actually get to um, get to work in the soil, etc. So I'm uh, I don't want to disturb that particular process. And I know the difference between in ground and growing in a bucket because in ground they say not to disturb the soil, but 
in a in a raised bed you have to disturb the soil because you've got to clean that soil out from all the roots that are growing in there etc so there's a, it's a lot more so you're disturbing the the micro um, organisms in that soil more than you would disturb it if you were growing in ground etc so yes i do change uh, i do change the soil On the on my I don't have a blog I just have a flick, I have a Flickr site and that so, but I can send you a link to uh, to them and I don't think I put it on uh, I don't think I put it on this handout etc. But yes. I, you put enough in there until it until it drains out of the uh, overflow hole and then you stop. That's it, and then you um, and then you go by. You can you can develop. I think I I don't know if I I did bring it, but I can't see it right now. You can you can make your own water indicators by a, a bamboo a skewer and a and a cork, and you can uh, let that float. And as the water goes down, or you can just eyeball it. What I do is I usually kick the uh, side of the the pot and listen for the water. But you can tell after a while what. When it needs it, like this summer, last summer, my tomatoes were taking a gallon of water a day, and that just in that one two-week period, they just sucked up a lot of water. So I knew, you know, from uh, from a few years of working with it. But yeah, you can put an indicator in there. But the first thing you do is you fill it up until it fo uh, flows out, and that, and then. That's right. That's right, and then I start and I take it out and and, uh, and go to the next bed. But you see, when you're doing an automatic watering system, you don't have to do any of that. It does the the float valve will do it for you, etc. And that if you want to go, but to me, I never that system came out a couple of years after I had already uh, did this one, so I never and my and it needs. You need to have a completely level environment to work with this system because the water will pool in one area and that stuff. So I wasn't going to reconstruct my roof for that, but but yes. I, it's um, it's they're called um, it's fourteen fourteen fourteen. That's the uh, that's the uh, um, um, and. It's it's a long it's a slow release fertilizer so it eats either 40 days or 70 days. I I think you know I'm not too sure I I meant to check that but I think it is but it looks like this I did bring. If you want to know what those pro, what those things look like, they're all in these um, so fertilizer. Um, here, that's what it looks like. So if you want to know what rock dust looks like, compost, rock dust, green sand, they're in here. Well, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm, but I am, I am game to, uh, game to uh, try a fertilizer, an organic fertilizer. I have done fish, but just sprayed it on the bottom of my leaves and that. But I haven't tried it. But yes, I would, uh, if you have one to recommend, I'd, I'd highly, I'd, I'd be interested. Yes, it is. It's on that. It's on the handout. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. It does. It's uh, you would be amazed. Um, the question was. Uh, I'm supposed to be uh, repeating the question. The question was, do you need those minerals for to enhance the flavor of your vegetables? Yes. Yes. There is a big difference in taste, and that and. Oh yeah, and um, especially the rock dust, this, because it adds minerals to your soil, right? And our our soil is minerally depleted in that. And this is uh, this I recommend, in that. But it does. There is a difference in taste, in that. So. <laughs> On the internet, and that you have to. They don't sell them here. There is a. There is a. Uh, um, an opportunity for uh, for a business here for small plot gardeners, right? If you take a look at the English and what is available for small plot gardeners in England, it's amazing, right? And there's really, they're called build a ball system, build a ball. That's it.
and uh, and you can't find them here. I bought them on the internet, and um, uh, and they don't. In, and the, even the catalog that I was given initially, they that company doesn't ship to Canada, and that stuff. But eventually, you can buy them on Amazon now. I just saw them the other day on Amazon, but they're uh, and the tubes. The tubes? No, the tubes. You have to. It's a, there's a company in in Toronto called Metal Supermarket. Oh, I know it. Yeah, they will cut those tubes for you. And that, so, and the uh, the um, um, uh, conduit, you can buy it. Uh, you can buy it at Home Depot. It's electrical conduit. Yes, I did. I started everything from seed. I have. I bought a, a seating table um, uh, from a friend of mine's mother who was moving out for a hundred dollars, and I have a, uh, a three-tiered uh, seating table. No, close to close to yeah, yeah, the end of April. Um, yeah, somewhere around there, if I remember. No, I've started my pepper seeds already, and um, pepper, and um, and I do I grow my annuals now. I like uh, I like so I grow. They take a long time. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, your tomatoes are up. Oh, I don't start until the middle of March. <laughs> You're, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Oh, yes. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.